So let's make some shiny solder balls over here. This is the new JC U15 UFS programmer, and it is for programming UFS chips. UFS is kind of like the hard drive of an Android phone. So on iPhones, they're called NANDs. On Android, it's called UFS. And these chips is where all the data is stored. Now with this programmer, we cannot just read the user data, but there's some other things we can do with it, like check the health of the chip and storage upgrades, as well as probably some other stuff that I'm not aware of. So in today's video, I'm gonna show you guys how to use this programmer, how it works, what comes with it, and maybe you'll decide you'll get one for yourself. So let's go ahead and get started. So this is basically all you're gonna get in the box. So you're gonna have the socket, which supports VGA 153, 254, and 297. Inside here, there's the little alignment jigs. So this one specifically is for 153 and 254, and you can see the orientation dot up there. Now it does come with the alignment jigs for the other chips and the different sizes, and these are magnetic. What you can do is just, with some tweezers, pop it out. So just make sure you follow that up message there that goes to the top and it just snaps right in with that all right so this is the actual programmer so this thing pops in here to, and then lastly is the power cable so this plugs into plug it into a five volt brick that can output uh, at least two amps that way it can power the ufs chips so this will go to a cable over here so this is my, this is my charging brick on an extension cable you plug this in here and then it also supports the different, uh, I guess, protocols or whatever. I just use it on auto and it seems to work fine like that. This has different sockets. So depending on whatever uh, chip you're using, you gotta plug it in to that, line it up to that one. Pretty much in most cases that I've seen, they're using the BGA-153, which is basically this shape here, which is like, I would say a good 90% of Android phones. Uh, just from the ones I've seen. Now you should get a stencil like this one. This is, you have to buy it separate. Uh, this is the Kianli. Uh, I got this from Mobile Centrix, but pretty much any stencil maker or any vendor should have this. It's the EMMC, EMCP. And then you can see it has the different layouts. Now one thing is the BGA-153 is basically the same as the 169. So just keep that in mind. And then this is what the 254 looks like. Now I don't have a stencil for 297. Actually, I don't think I've ever seen that one, but it's there. Like I said, the most common is 153. So we're gonna line up that socket there. And there we go. Now on the back side here on the top, there's a USB-C port. So there's nothing else on here. Now, when I first saw this, I thought this uh, expansion slot was for the JCV1S Pro but apparently it's for power, so just keep that in mind. This is not uh, for the JCV1S Pro, it's directly to your computer. So data cable to the PC, uh, power cable to a charging brick, so keep that in mind. Now another thing that kind of threw me off is when you first plug it in, you will get no chime from the computer. That's not until you plug in a chip. So the UFS chip should be rebuilt as well. So I'll show you guys that process right now. So this is just a random UFS from a donor board. Uh, last time I tested it, it was good. So it should be good this time too. So go ahead and line up the stencil. Now there's one dot in here. This is like the orientation dot basically built into the pad layout. All right, so if you look at the dot, it matches up with this one. So just keep that in mind when you're aligning the stencil. All right, find that dot and there you go. So let's make some shiny solder balls over here. Apply some 183 solder paste. This is a Mechanic XG50 paste. This is one of my favorite soldering paste uh, that I've tested. Then using some curved tweezers. All right, we're gonna use 330 on 25% air. Now make sure your paste is dried out. If it's too wet, it's gonna create a problem when you're trying to reball it here. So just go in little circles and just heat it up and just be patient. The chip is kind of large, so it does take a little longer to melt the solder. If you were dealing with a smaller chip, then it would have been a lot faster. Now I think I am missed the lines. All right, we might have to do this <laughs> again. Oh boy, but yeah, I can see the pads. Let's shift it over. Oh, look at that. We are lined up again. 
So while it's hot, I just shifted the stencil back into place and I'm gonna just reploy it one more time. And we have corrected my mistake. Let's see if uh, this is fixed. There you go. I think that was, that was it. Now, if you ever reball and you have uneven balls there, what you should do is get a blade, try to shave off the top layer. Then, well, in this case, you can see they all shaved exactly the same. So it's not gonna really make a difference. Just come in, shave off the top, and then reapply some more paste uh, on top of it. And basically what you'll have is it'll fill in the crevices for, um, for the ones that are too small. The ones that are too big were chopped off and flattened out. Now get a clean cloth and wipe this down. You wanna basically remove that excess paste that's just laying around. And I can come back and reflow it one more time. And then you'll have a beautiful, even solder ball, uh, shiny solder balls there. So let's go ahead and reflow this one more time. Now look at that. And because we now have solder balls, the alignment will be perfect. So we don't have to worry about that. Look at that. Let it uh, solidify. So we'll go from shiny solder balls to dull solder balls. Matte color looking. So sometimes, you know, depending on your paste, if it's too wet, you might have a bunch of uh, pieces of paste in between. You know what? Let's use uh, my new Woozip uh, brush here. There you go. It's now reballed. But uh, always remember, clean your stencils every single time. Do not put it away with paste and flux burnt on there. All right, cool. So this is the chip here. I'm gonna uh, clean it up a little more just to make sure it's good. I am going to line up the dots, that arrow with the dots, you know, that extra pad on there, extra pin. All right, lines right up. Now, uh, one thing that I learned years ago is make sure this thing is sitting in the slot. If it's slightly off and you clamp it down, you're gonna Crack that chip and it's game over. Plug it in, there's a blue light, and now it's green. So one thing I noticed is I just had one that had a dead UFS or a shorted, and this thing just stayed red the whole time. So let me see, unplug it, no UFS detected, is red. When a dead UFS is there, it's also red. So another thing is once you close it in and it turns green, give it a few seconds and then you'll hear the chime. So this thing does not detect until you put a working UFS in there. So if you ever have a dead UFS or a shorted UFS or a bad one or whatever, and as you're plugging it in, this thing stays red, the PC does not detect, it does not chime, then you know there's a problem with the chip. So make sure you're reballing the chips, you know, make sure it's clean, you know, drop isopropyl alcohol to make sure it's a good connection. Next, you're gonna need the JC Repair Assistant software. I'll post a link to this, or you can just go to jcprogrammer.com and download it there. It is free, but create the login, and then when you log in, you know, you can then access the features on here. A lot of these features, you don't even need a programmer plugged in. So just, uh, it's a useful tool. So make sure you, up here, you install the USB driver. This is right here, UFS driver. That will make sure that the PC can detect it and actually communicate with the device. And then you wanna click here on UFS, and then you just wait. So this thing will auto detect. There you go, see, it's reading. So this is basically telling us the generic info of the chip itself, the UFS. So it's manufactured by Toshiba, the model number. There is a date. I don't know how to interpret that. Um, yeah, so some other info here, but uh, you'll see here a capacity. Some useful information, the capacity, uh, there's, there's a serial number. And then here's the most important thing. So basically what I use this for is when I'm doing a CPU swap, I pop in the UFS in here to make sure that the 
UFS is so good because there's a lot of jobs where we're basically doing a CPU swap just because there's no, we can't figure out what the problem is. The phone's not turning on and, and we need to basically transplant just the bare minimum chips, the CPU and the UFS to a working board and see if it turns on. And one, one way to see if the UFS is bad is just with this. So if the UFS is good and you swap it over and it still doesn't turn on, then maybe the CPU is bad or you did a bad swap. But at least this tells us that the UFS where the data is at is good. So you can see here, hard disk usage, the device lifetime zero to 100. So I don't know what it looks like on this programmer as far as what a bad one will look like, but what I've seen is, is ba basically on another tool, it'll be a similar message, but except that it'll be like 80, 90, uh, and then it'll give you warnings actually. It'll say, um, you know, failing or something. I forget the wording, but it'll say some wording where it, it, you'll know like, okay, this chip is failing and maybe that's why it doesn't read. And then here's the different partitions uh, listed here. So there's one for 238, one for eight, one for eight, oh, megabytes, and then 60 megabytes. Now, there's a feature here, or drop down. I don't know what it says, but it says HS and PWM. Let's swap it over and see if, uh, see if we can still read it. Um, I haven't used this enough to know the difference between the two options, but anytime I've had issues reading one, I just keep, I like I switch between the two and see if it reads uh, one versus the other. I'm guessing one is high speed versus pulse width modulation. I don't know. All right, and then uh, this button here is doesn't reset or, or factory reset the chip. It just disconnects and reconnects. So for whatever reason you need to you know restart the chip, you can just click that button and it'll restart. All right, there we go. So now I'll just I guess it auto reads when the uh, chip is detected. Now I did uh, also. Did not mention this? So this is the actual like data on the phone. So it's, you know, all the operating system files and stuff like that. Now you will find there's a user data partition here that you can technically export. So you click backup bin, but the thing with, with Android 7.0 and newer is encryption is enabled by default, meaning you cannot read the data directly. You can't just dump this file and then use a program, uh, special program to read the bin file and then there's all the data like you could on S6 and older. S7 and newer, Android, uh, well, Android 7.0 and newer, same as the Galaxy S7, they have encryption enabled by default. So pretty much the, the operating system has essentially jumbled the data where the key to unjumble that data is pretty much in the CPU. So only way to get that data is to unlock the phone and then pull the data that way. So you basically need both CPU and UFS working condition. One thing I did forget to mention earlier is, you know, there's the different VGAs it supports, 153, 254, 297. It does not support UFS from S6 and Note 5 phones, Samsung phones. Those are BGA 95 and it's not listed here. It also doesn't have any pinouts so you can jump, uh, run jumpers. So this just is just not on the table. Now will JC release a socket for BGA95? I don't know, but I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Maybe if, we, uh, if enough of us ask, they'll do it. So for now, we cannot do any chip off data recovery with this programmer because this is only for UFS. Uh, 153 chips and those are encrypted basically only eMMC chips you can do chip off and that's a whole different programmer and protocol so this is the, does not apply to that so now let me show you another chip which I don't know if they're the same so this one was Toshiba I believe get this one out now this one's already reballed uh, so let's go in there plug it in now this button clear here, it just wipes the text screen. It doesn't actually clear any data from the chip. There it goes, there's another one. Uh, we can see it is actually a 59 gigs, basically 64 gig chip. Um, and yeah, same, same stuff, it's kind of same layout. 
Now, you could technically also do storage upgrades with these. Now, I've never done it personally, like any Android phone, but from what the JC uh, YouTube video said. So basically my understanding on how to do a storage upgrade is that you have to do a backup, select all, backup XML, and say backup. And then it's gonna start backing up. Now, one of the selling points to this UFS programmer is that it's using uh, USB-C speed, so it can read and write way faster than the other programmers out there. Now, I've never done this process <laughs> before, so I don't know if this is uh, fast or not. But basically, this is gonna back up all the partitions and kind of all that information. And then you can write it to a new UFS. So I think you'll have to format it first. So there's a re erase button and then you can write this one. So I don't know how long it's gonna take cause this is a, what was it? Uh, 64 gig. So it might take uh, a while. So I'm not gonna uh, do that. But essentially the step is you back up the XML. So you'll click import and then you get a list of LUNs or LUNs. And essentially you select all those and then you click write. Now you basically, you know, write the data that you read from the original chip onto the new chip. But if you're doing a storage upgrade, essentially after that, you have to click repair GPT. Now, I don't know exactly what this is all doing, but that's what I saw in the instructional video. So I'll have to try that one day. Let me know down below in the comments if you guys want me to experiment and see if, if it's a straightforward process or if it gets a little complicated. On iPhones, it's really straightforward. On this one, it's all like new to me, so I'm not familiar. So let, let's just uh, browse through these other tabs. Maybe if you guys know a little more about this, let me know down below in the comments. All right, so I've stopped the operation because that's gonna take forever. I'm gonna do USFS config, and then here's the different menu options that you have on there. Oh, look at that, we could format the UFS. Now the question is, does it work? Because <laughs> I clicked it, nothing happened. Well, uh, if you're familiar with this, uh, let me know down below in the comments. Uh, DES config. So I guess this is kind of how the, the UFS is formatted and set up. Now, I don't know anything about this, but here, let me just show you the menus in case uh, you find it useful. Uh, you can click through here. I don't really know what I can, oh, I guess you can select your LUN, uh, you know, number, LUN zero, and then you set here, whatever, a different settings. So I guess uh, this is why it's useful to read the original, that way you don't have to mess with any of this. Yeah, this is way more complicated than iPhone NANs. <laughs> All right, clock uh, config. I have no idea about any of this. This is like way, way over my, my head. Flag. These are just read only, I guess. And share. Huh, I don't know what that. But if you can, uh, maybe just like, oh, maybe it's like, Seems like informational, but it's in Chinese, so I don't know Chinese. But if you guys know Chinese, this might be helpful. Who knows, maybe they'll make an English one later or use Google Translate. Well, I guess you guys can browse through here and see if you guys find anything useful, but uh, I think that's pretty much it. Huh, it looks like a guide for something, but what it is, who knows? So that's pretty much it with this programmer. So if you guys have any specific questions on how to use this, drop it down below in the comments. If you're way more familiar with this and you have something specific you wanna correct or you want me to uh, explain in a future video, let me know as well. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you guys are smashing the like button, subscribing. You know, I have links down below in the video description with a lot of useful stuff, even like my t-shirts, my uh, locals community, links to all the tools I use in my videos. They're all, there's all kinds of useful information down there. Of course, I will link to where to buy this programmer as well. So appreciate all you guys who stuck around here. I'll post another related video down here. So thanks everyone for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one.